to tell you, my, my mother is in absolute shock, shock and awe that I am sitting here with uh, <laughs> Dick Cavett and Peter Marshall. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what I did to deserve uh, this, this honor for myself, but it's... Uh, a little spotlight, I'm awfully pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so we have two mics, I'll, I'll hand mine back and forth. Okay, but, fine, Jason. But um, we'll, uh, we'll start this off with saying this, is, this film was a three-year project for myself and my team. My darling, I've known Larry since I'm 14. I've known Rose since we were, well, uh, she's 94, I'm 91. So we've known each other since we were in our early 20s. And we uh, worked together as, uh, as young performers. And of course, then I was luck I lucked out a lot uh, having her on the uh, Hollywood Squares. Mm -hmm. But uh, she's still as feisty as ever. I'll have friends of mine call and say, can I meet Rosemary? And I said, well, let me give her a call. I called, Ro, uh, so-and-so would like to meet you. She said, sure. And I'll go over to the house, and she's in a wheelchair, but she, the hair is perfect, and the whole thing, and Noopy's no, normally there, her daughter. And uh, then <laughs> I leave, and then she gives me a call. She said, you son of a bitch, I gotta get my hair up, I gotta get makeup on, what the hell are you doing to me? I said, why don't you just say no? She said, I can't say no to you. So that's Rosemary. Yeah, yeah, she's, She's as feisty as ever, and you know, you had the thing with she said, waiting for her next job. She is waiting for her next job. <laughs> yeah, God love her. I, I, I love this film. Did you like it? I hope you like it. <laughs> this, this kid right here and his lovely wife, Christina, they put it together, they wrote it, and they produced it, and they directed it, and and uh. Uh, to do a, a film about old people like me, uh, I admire you. Thank you so much, Jay. You did a hell of a job. Thank you so much. I, 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 uh, this, I, I never really looked at this movie as a film about old people. You know, you have to understand, I think the biggest problem with my generation, the generation even before me, is that we don't have any idea of how things got to where they are. And that's part of why I, I asked Mr. Cavett to come here is because nobody, nobody on the earth that I know of has interviewed more of American culture and how it has come to what it is to this point. And why I wanted Dick to come is to be able to speak about how things have changed and how we are where we are. And first of all, did you like the movie? This is the first time he's seen it, I think. <laughs> yes. Uh I'm, I'm sorry that I never met her, but I just love this, and I'm, I'm staying for part two. <laughs> <laughs> Rosemary has a story. Rosemary told me that you called her at her house. Do you remember this? I, I, I will say I do, but frankly, no. <laughs> <laughs> so Rosemary, Rosemary um, Dick, whether he remembers or not, called Rosemary at, at her house, and they had a conversation just... A general conversation that I imagine famous people do. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Rosemary basically, she, so she told me this story and she said, "Do you know who is the most wonderful man in the world? Dick Cavett." And I said, "Why?" She goes, "Because he called me up and didn't want anything from me. <laughs> and nobody calls me up and doesn't want anything. He just called and said, "How come you were never on my show?" And Rosemary said. How come you never asked me to film my show? Yeah, it is coming back and quite quickly. Uh, yeah, uh, I can do a tasteless joke to send back to her saying, I thought it was Rosemary Clooney I was calling. To. <laughs> she, would, she, at she would love that very much. <laughs> so, Dick, Dick, when you, when you see a film like this, how do you feel about American entertainment and the way it started and the way it is now, do you see uh, a congruency with the way things have worked and the way from radio, vaudeville, theaters? I mean, how, how in your mind as somebody who's been able to watch this as an interviewer with your show on PBS, how do you see entertainment moving? I'm not much of a, a philosopher or historian, but uh, I, I, I do offend the young by <laughs> uh, informing them if they want to know that there were giants then, there are giants now. There were just more then. <laughs> I mean, I feel sorry for any human who does not know the name Fred Allen. 
Oh boy. Uh, my dad wouldn't let anybody speak when Fred Allen's radio show was on. Allen's Alley. Allen's Alley, yes, yeah. And what a wit, a, a turn of mind comparable to Groucho's. Weird turns of mind. And I don't know anybody now who um, really compares uh, in any really significant way to them. This is a, some comics were sitting around once, I think Alan King told me, and they were all doing, um, it was so hot that each one would try, and it was, any young man would try, and her would try. And for this day they were doing, it was so windy. And everybody had done a reasonable good joke. Fred Allen said, it was so windy, I saw a hen lay the same egg twice. <laughs> Yet, Dick, you know, he never could make the transition to television. Yeah, which was so was sad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he uh, such a great uh, mind, such a great wit, such a great writer, but he couldn't make TV. Doesn't accommodate everybody, does yeah. it? And Fred Allen did never get the great, great success that, say, Milton Berle did. He was not entirely happy about that no, specific no. case. In fact, I shouldn't reveal this, so I won't. Uh, <laughs> oh, about Burl's success, Fred Allen wrote once in a letter to Groucho, Milton is the moron's messiah. <laughs> uh, among others, Catherine Hepburn and Betty Davis and Groucho Marx and Fred Astaire and uh, uh, on and on Marlon Brando and uh, who all else and I was on a radio show and I, he said would you say Dick that there were redwoods then looking at that list of people on that show of yours Hitchcock um, I said yeah there certainly were but uh, there are plenty of redwoods today I mean uh, Meryl Streep is hardly an elm tree <laughs> <laughs> When it, when it comes he was to, amused, by the way. When it, when it comes to thinking about people like that who have, have staggering influence in the industry, I think Rosemary has not gotten, I think it's safe to say not gotten virtually any credit for her role through being a strong character, not just being a woman, but being a strong character in general in television. What, what do you think, both of you, what do you think Rosemary's lasting influence in the industry is? I, I really can't give you a critique on that. I, I, I really don't know. I know that there's nobody, uh, there's nobody around today like, like the Rosemarys. Or, I, I go back to vaudeville. I, you know, I, I, I started, this is my 76th year of doing this for a living. And I remember the old days of Bill Barth and of Gene Carroll, the comedian, and a great, great impressionist, her name, uh, Sheila Barrett, and, and of course, uh, Kay Ballard. And, uh, and I don't see any of these young people doing what they could do. They could, they sang, they, they could act, they did wonderful comedy, and uh, they could come out into an hour, an hour and a half, you know. And uh, I don't see that much in the young performers, but then I'm not into today's music. I'm not in today's, I'm not in today's comedy, so to speak. The Amy Schuler, uh, what's her name? Like, I, 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 you couldn't, and when I was a kid, you couldn't say damn. In, in a theater, in a nightclub. So you, what you had to do was be clever. And, uh, the, uh, you know, I may be an old fogey. I can remember my dad liking, uh, you know, Jack Dempsey. And I loved Joe Lewis. And there was be nobody like Joe Lewis. Then there was Holly. You know, so every, every era, I guess, has its champions. But uh, I come from vaudeville, and I come from th th those days, and I don't see many young performers doing what they could do. I mean, Roe could do everything. And uh, it seems it's like that a fashion that has faded somehow. I guess so. I don't know. Yeah. It's taste. Uh, I, I don't know what the heck it is. I, uh, anyway. Well, I'd like to ask you could there be a Jack Benny today? I can't conceive of it. I, I don't see any Jack Benny. That, incidentally, you, you just mentioned my two favorites uh, Jack Benny and, and Fred and Allen. Fred I, Allen. I, those are my two favorites of all, on radio especially. Uh, and I don't see any of that today. Um, I don't see many talk things, by the way, Mr. Cabot, uh, that really interest me. Uh, I would love to see you do a late night show again, to be frank with you. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be solicitous. I, I, I just miss what you did. 
and it, it's different, and I don't see anything different today. Well, there's some immediate help for you because my shows are being shown five nights a week on the decade. Yeah. That, uh, that I know. That I know, and that, uh, that I watch. But yeah, I have no idea how fun it is to see yourself that age. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see old reruns, and I, I, you know, I look like Joanne Drew. <laughs> of course, I, that was my sister, so we, we didn't look alike. <laughs> By the way, one other thing, Helen O'Connell. You know, they really, they really built the Helen. I've known Helen O'Connell since I was 12 years of age. She was my sister's best friend, Joanne, and they named their children. I did Manhattan Tower, the great Gordon Jenkins thing on TV. She was my leading lady. I did, uh, I toured with her when Bob Everly couldn't make the date. I would do the Bob Everly things. Uh, tangerine, she is. All, I did all of that kind of stuff. But I loved Helen O'Connell, but she was a pain in the ass. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I love Helen O'Connell too, but I saw her kick a dog once. <laughs> may I tell you what may be my favorite story? It's not totally irrelevant. I know Rose Maria and Jack Benny admired each other. I rode down the elevator at NBC once after a Tonight taping where I was a writer and with Jack Benny and his Burberry coat belted. And a bunch of tourists got in the star elevator. They weren't supposed to. This will be nostalgia for some of you and totally cryptic to the rest. <laughs> uh, from the seventh floor down, Mr. Benny, the loveliest, cleanest working man, adored by everyone in show business, did charity things anonymously. It was just wonderful. It was sort of a, down at the other end of the scale from Danny Kay. And, uh, <laughs> is he your best friend too? Oh, no, 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 no. Danny Kay was not beloved. <laughs> on the seventh floor, on the way down, he got, do you still drive to Maxwell? And then the next floor he got, are you really cheap? And, uh, you don't pay Rochester much, uh, and this lovely man nodded at each one of these. Uh, um, can you really play the violin, or is that somebody else? And he would nod and smile. But, uh, they ran off to tell the friends. I uh, stood next to him and said, Mr. Benny, doesn't that get kind of old, those same references? And this lovely, adored man put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, you know, kid, Sometimes you you just want to tell them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> I have a Jack Benny story. 1950, uh, at the uh, police show in L.A., I, I was then doing a comedy act with Tommy Noonan. You have to be very old to remember Noonan and Marshall. But anyway, we were quite popular at the time, and we used to do a bit where uh, I would come out and say, uh, what does the singer think about after doing the same damn song for 50 years? You know, like Tony, but it, I let my heart say, I mean, the, your mind must have to wander. So this is what a singer might think about after singing the same song, the hit song, for 50 years. And Tommy would be backstage on the microphone. And I would say, embrace me, my sweet embraceable you. He said, I think I'm going to get sick. <laughs> Embrace me. Oh, there's a girl over there. And we did it. And anyway, Jack Benny loved this. He said, God, I'd love to. I'm going to England. Is there any way I could use this bit? And I said, sure. Or it might have been Tommy. Uh, why, at the end, with the violin, just say, you know, what a wonderful evening this has been. This has been one of the greatest evenings of my life. And the ambiance, this theater is magnificent. And this orchestra, my God, and you as an audience are phenomenal. And then he started to play. This is the worst night of my life. <laughs> His voice, he re-recorded. And it was a smash. And when he came back, uh, MCA, it was handled by MCA, he, they called and said, uh, could Mr. Benny uh, use this in America? And I said, well, Jesus, it's a big hit for Tommy and myself, and I, I, I would appreciate him not doing it. He called personally, and he said, uh, Pete, we really don't play to send venues. And I said, that is true. <laughs> and he said, I would love to do it, and I'll give you guys credit. I said, no, no, no. And he said, now this is 1950, 51. 
He sent us a check for $3,500. Huh. Now, I don't know if you know how much money that was in 1950. My first house cost $15,000 in 1952. Anyway, years later, I'm doing squares, and I walk out and, at NBC, and he's in a bathrobe. And I said, Jack, what, geez, are you, uh, what are you doing? Said, I just did a commercial. He said, how's Tommy? I said, he passed away in 1968. Oh, he said, that's right, I know that. I said, are you still doing the bit? He said, what bit? <laughs> I said, the bit we wrote for you, you know, with the He said, that's right, you guys wrote us this bit, damn it. The next day, I have a knock on my door, and there's a, a limo out there, and a guy gives me a little package like this, a little, and I open it, and it's a money, gold, solid gold money clip, it says to Pete. And on the back is that wonderful line drawing of his. I don't know if you recall that wonderful line drawing. And that is my experience with Mr. Benning, who I adored. Mm -hmm. so, what a guy. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, why, don't we, why don't we open up to a few questions? I, I, um, anybody have any questions about the film? Any questions for the guys up here? Yes, right there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, I had so much amazing stuff that I couldn't get over that was kept by her, and how did, how did this come about that you couldn't even find anything? He said you had so much amazing footage that was found. Footage and, and yeah. And yeah. It came about through, I don't know, have you ever seen, an, have you ever seen the show Hoarders? <laughs> <laughs> it came about through searching through a room that was very similar to, no, she... She, Rosemary casually mentioned in the early parts of this film, you know, I have a bunch of film I shot on the Dick Van Dyke show and Gunsmoke and um, Bob Cummings show, and she named tons of stuff. She's like, it's just sitting back there. Maybe you could use it. I'm like, maybe I could use it. <laughs> I, lost, I literally lost my mind. So, so, so what I did was, you know, we transferred, oh, I don't know, thousands upon thousands of feet of Super 8 millimeter, 16 millimeter, the crazy stuff. I mean, stuff... You wouldn't believe this film could have been 29 hours long if we had done, you know, what represented the incredible footage she had. And so we transferred it all and sorted it out, and it basically, it all came from Rosemary. I mean, aside from, we did shoot, you know, more than I think people realize in this film, but, but she just saved everything. I mean, napkins, napkins from every performance she did in the 1950s, uh, the salt packets, the... It really was not orders, by the way. It's very organized, and you know, books, and you know, she was very organized. She scrapbooked like a crazy person. So like, she has everything laid out for us. Especially, you know, I will say the opening of that flamingo. There is no record of that. I mean, it is basically lost to history. And then all of a sudden, Rosemary says, "Oh, you know, I have a whole book about that." So I open it up, and here we go. There's the invitation. There's the tickets. There's the napkins. There's the blah blah blah. There's this. There's that. There's there's some footage, I mean, it's crazy. And so, you know, I don't, people don't, I think this will stagger people who are into that kind of time period. And the fact, you know, one thing Peter said when he first saw the movie that blew me away was, and he had, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, you know, the one thing that this movie did that no other film has done, and this means so much to us as filmmakers, is it didn't neglect the World War II, 1940s, 1950s area where everything was live performances. And... There is no footage of that stuff. It just happened for 20 years, and this is what you guys did forever. Yep. And it just doesn't. You, nobody covers it. Nobody talks about it. It's all. It's all movies or television and, you know, not really radio. People don't cover that. And so it meant so much to me, and it means so much that Rosemary preserved this material. So it all came from her. So, yeah, that's the answer to that. Um, yeah. Um. So I. Instead of coming to you afterwards, I thought I would just say it here in front of everyone. Firstly, I want to thank you as a New Yorker for uh, this screening here, and to also say that this movie is just incredible in the way that you communicate um, the emotions and feelings of Rosemary the way she felt it when it happened. I felt it. I laughed. I cried. Um, I was thrilled to be taken back to New York in the 1940s. I'm hoping you're a reviewer for the New York Times. <laughs> 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 it Thank you. Designer, but in terms of the, the 
you, you, you asked I, whether we liked the movie. Why would you even ask? <laughs> because I'm a terrified filmmaker. <laughs> I, I just hope you would do more. Uh, I would I would watch the 29 hours. Oh, well, the, I will tell you right now, the special features in the DVD will be your 29 hours, don't worry. Um, you know, th there's, there's, there's something in this, like where she worked the Capitol Theater, and everybody worked that. I mean, that, that theater, prior to being torn down, was absolutely one of the marquee theaters in the United States. I mean, it was the, the it premiered 2001 A Space Odyssey. It was the last thing that happened, and then it was torn down. And that is kind of what I mean with history just not being, it's so funny. I mean, Peter, Peter says to me so many times, why do you want me to come to the Q&A? Nobody remembers who I am. Oh, and I, but, but he doesn't no. say it from a, from a standpoint, he says it in the standpoint of he's just watched so many legends you know, Red Skelton and all these people and nobody talks about him anymore. So, but all I can think of is, yeah, and let's change that. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. not the way, and it's not true, by the way, he's just, he's a martyr. But, but it's absolutely important that, that generations understand, um, and Rosemary is a separate issue, because Rosemary is, in my opinion, her own thing. She never got a chance to actually be recognized. And to play a role in the Dick Van Dyke show where you're not a mother, you're not a daughter, you're not a wife, you're not a girlfriend, you're in the writer's room. And Carl gets a lot of credit for this too. I don't mean she totally, you know, but, but to do that and to own it and to be that character and to go through everything she did to do it, I, I think it's, it's time for people to recognize that. And with the climate in the world right now, and I have two daughters, okay, and I really... Women are already in charge, they just don't realize it. Um, I really, I, I think Rosemary, Carl Reiner said to me when we finished the film, how did you make a film about somebody who didn't do drugs, barely drank, only was married to one person, and it's not a piece of shit. How did you do that? And I said to him, I, I, I'm like, so it's not a piece of shit? <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it's an amazing thing, and I think these people, Peter, you know, Rosemary, Carl, Dick, even Dick. I mean, astoundingly, people are like, who's Dick Van Dyke? I mean, I'm telling you right now. It is, the, the tide is at a point here. And that's why to be able to sit up on a panel right here with, I, I, I say this with absolutely no, the greatest interviewer that's ever lived. I mean, I, I don't have any, there's, there's a fact. And this guy sings like, you know, the voice of Silk still. And he's, how old are you, 60? <laughs> 60 God, years old. would that be fun? <laughs> I, My I mean, wife would really appreciate that. <laughs> it's, it, your, your words mean so much to myself and my crew. I mean, there are producers in the audience, Melissa and Dave, and you know everybody, we all, to hear you say that means so much. And so much, this is a two-part film. Part New York, part LA, with Vegas sort of you know, yeah. in the middle. But it is absolutely means so much to hear you say that. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, go right here. Peter Martin. Wait, what? Yes. I know you were a boy singer with the uh, big band. I was. Before Hollywood Squares. I was. Are you still singing? I am still singing. In fact, I got a couple of dates I'm coming up with the Benny Goodman right. band. I'm doing some dates with the uh, Tex Benny band. Incidentally, it's, it's, they're all the same band, they just have different leaders. <laughs> Everybody's gone. Yeah, but I still have dates, yeah, I still sing. Give us a song, give us a song. Uh, what, what would you like to hear? <laughs> no, that's okay. But, uh, I, I, you know, I talk about the old guy, I talk about Dick Ames, who was my idol, who actually was like my surrogate father. He married my sister when I was 14, and I lost my dad when I was 10. I don't, how many people remember Dick Ames? And, and to Bob Everett, people like that. So yeah, I still I still work a day once in a while. I was a little rattled by a question about two years ago or three. Mr. Cabot, um, who uh, were the Marx Brothers and who was Johnny Carson? Oh, oh my God. You got to ask that in the public? I went home and fainted. Uh, <laughs> this lady? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cabot, we have no more room on our TiVo because everything is you on that page. <laughs> and I mean that literally. Uh, Mr. Marshall, nobody was ever smoother at steering a talk show than you. Well, thank you. And Mr. Wise, what was your impetus 
for trying to document the history of American entertainment and what from there led you to Rosemary? Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a, I'm gonna I'm gonna my wife is not she's she's gonna be here sure as she lands any minute. She would be very on me about the answer to this question. So I'm gonna try to be very concise. Um, I wrote, she gets here. Yeah, right. Well, Rosemary, you, you have to understand, good films, or at least films you want to make, whether they're good or not, they come organically. And I wanted to make a film that went through American entertainment, through all the, pro you know, and very different from what this is. Rosemary, I thought it was Mickey Rooney. I did. And I didn't have the credibility as a filmmaker, and Mickey Rooney started having um, memory issues. So it was a combination of people didn't, you know, I didn't have any credibility, which is probably the number one problem. And then Mickey Rooney having mental issues. And I, I think in the middle of all of that and all my research and what we were trying to do, Rosemary's publicist said to me, do you, you really should talk to Rosemary. And I said, from the Dick Van Dyke show. He said, yeah. And I said, about what? <laughs> Meaning like, I didn't mean it in a, I didn't mean it in a negative way. I meant like, I thought he meant to interview her. I didn't know he meant as a main subject. And I have to give him, I mean, I, this is the most wonderful man in the world because my life will never be the same because of this movie, never. I adore Rosemary in a way I can't tell you guys. I mean, she is, she is not an old lady to me. She is not, you know, even a performer. To me, she is like one of my best friends. I, I go to her house three times a week. Um, she is brutally honest about politics and everything with me and we have conversations about the world. She is, I, I, I love her, I love this woman. So, but when he started telling me these stories about Al Capone and Bugsy Siegel and all this stuff, I thought, there's no way this is true. <laughs> if 1%, because he's a publicist, if 1% is true, this could be the greatest movie I will ever make. And I went there and not only is it it's true, and I, there's no way for me to convey how true it is in this movie, because the movie has to be entertaining, it can't be bibliography, but it, it is true. And basically this came about over three years of production with Rosemary, and how that kind of process of having no budget to make a film, and you find ways to do it, and it's, and then you get a budget, you know, when people start figuring out, or when you have, you know, it's a very strange process, and for this particular movie it is very organic. And I will tell you, I am so happy to make a film where the person in it is not dead when you're making it. <laughs> it, it, it means so much to me because it's some of the greatest biopics, especially from a documentary standpoint, are this person died three years ago, so finally we can tell. Well, Rosemary has been trying to tell her story, and many people have tried to make films, by the way. They've turned a lot of people down, so I'm very fortunate. I don't mean she's like desperate or anything. But... She's been telling her story, and I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think people are listening. And when it comes to anybody in this audience who is working their ass off to just, let's say you have a kid, and you have a job, and you're doing everything you can to figure out how to make life work, whether in showbiz or not, Rosemary is the greatest, she is the greatest um, person to look up to in this regard, because she was a blue-collar showbiz person who didn't care. And she knew right away when she was famous on the Dick Van Dyke show, that's going to end. And she's going to have to figure something out. And she was a mom, and she was all these things, but before all of that, she was a very strong person who did not compromise. And for me making a film, it's the same mentality. You don't compromise. And so for Rosemary, she's, she's now my idol. I mean, she is the person I want my daughters to be. She's the person I want to be. I mean, I adore her. I don't even know what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm being told we have time for one more question. I'm so, so, so sorry. Yes, right, right here. I could compliment you on the technique of using the reenactments and folding those reenactments into the, into the real life. And I could compliment you on the brilliant use in the commentary that the music and the score uh, applied to mm -hmm. all of the content of it because mm -hmm. the music was very carefully chosen and obviously had a great deal to say and it's worth in a way seeing this movie several times. Mm -hmm. but Did you hear that? He said you should see the movie several times. <laughs> 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 but I think the highest compliment is the honesty with which not only you but Rosemary yeah. applied to the story of her own life in terms of her relationship with her family 
her relationship with her husband, yes. her relationship with her father, oh, her boy. relationship to everybody she worked with as honestly, particularly on the Dick Van Dyke show. Nobody really, I never realized, my wife worked with Rosemary, and the two of them were very honest with each other. But I don't know how much of that would ever go onto the screen in terms of the way we altered, but the honesty and the sincerity and the forthrightness with which this movie has been made is rare. There's one footnote in terms of the ages of everybody involved here, because you mentioned Fred Allen and the great wit that Fred Allen was. One of his main writers is still writing today. Mm -hmm. really, wow. And that man's name was Herman Woke. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Wow, hard to believe. I, I, I do I, like the last. I know we have to we have to wrap this, but I will say, think about you being your age now and putting your entire self on camera the way Rosemary did in this movie. That is not taken for granted, and the fact that she did it when she was in her nineties. I mean, fearless. She was born fearless, and in fifty to sixty years, she will die fearless. <laughs> you guys, thank you. Please, we are all over New York.